and the precious, most glorious, oh wonderful, name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. My name is Brian Mason, and in this particular series of Bible studies this week, I'm going to look at the word holy. And in the coming weeks and months, we'll be very much concentrating on those aspects within the, in the Bible, which have been, some of them, removed, and others not given the emphasis, not spoken about, as they should be. So this first one, holy, and the scripture is, And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Those were the words to Moses in chapter 3 of Moses and verse 5. And let's look at the, the context of this. From verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The mountain of God. A very significant place, a very special place, a place where there was that expectation that God in some way would be there. And Moses, he'd, what, he'd spent 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years, was it a wasted 40 years? After he'd left the, the, the palace of, of Pharaoh, and he'd come to this place which, in all accounts, was a wilderness. And he had made a new life in this wilderness, a life where he served his father-in-law, Jethro. And he'd been quite content to look after the sheep. But God, and it's always important to remember, but God, God had a purpose with Moses. Because Moses in the palace, yes, as far as this world went, he, he had everything. But he knew that, that he didn't belong to the palace. He belonged to those who were in slavery to Pharaoh. And he tried, he tried to resolve that matter of, of bringing the slaves out of captivity by himself. And he'd left because he had to leave. His life was in danger. But God knew all about this. And God had allowed him to come into the wilderness. And those years, they were not wasted years. They were years where God was quietly preparing Moses. Preparing him for this this particular time, and the time had come where God was to make himself known unto Moses and to make him, himself known as God. He was to make himself known as someone who was set apart from man. Someone who is holy. And it was the angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses. 
in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Can we picture that? That a bush, a burning bush, was nothing unusual in, in those days in, in, the, in the wilderness, in the desert. But the bush would have been burnt out, would have been consumed. But this particular bush, we're told, was not consumed. And Moses looked at this bush, and it was burning with fire, and the bush was not consumed, burning with fire, and not consumed. Now that is no ordinary event. It's quite an extraordinary event. And only God himself could do that. And it is the holiness of God which is the significance here. That God in his holiness, God in his glory had come to make himself known unto Moses. Moses whom we can, we can, it can be seen that God had set him apart. Set him apart for God's own purposes. And Moses had to be called and he had to be commissioned. And Moses had to be absolutely certain that he was called and commissioned by God because he had his doubts even when God revealed himself to him. He had his doubts as to whether he was uh, the right man, whether he was capable of doing that which God was asking of him. But it is in, it was to be in his own helplessness, in his own humility, and acknowledging that it wasn't what he could do, but only what God could do, that this great calling and commission could be fulfilled. But it is the holiness which is absolutely vital here because Moses came to see that God was truly the living God and it was the holiness of God which set God apart from anyone else and from any other gods, the heathen God. This was to be his moment, his moment of truth, his moment of coming to an understanding that God is the living God. Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Yes, a great sight, the holiness of God. It's a wonder Moses was not consumed with that holiness. But God, he wanted Moses for himself. Moses who had in his own eyes seen himself as a great failure. But it's as, as going down as it were. Before we can go up, we have to go down. Before you can go up, you have to go down. And it's the going down is the humility, the acknowledgement that it's not what I can do, not what you can do, but what God will do when he has us. Not just some of us, part of us, but the whole of us. And it is 
in seeing that holiness of God that we are reduced to nothing, absolutely to nothing, in the sight of a holy God, a perfect God, a God who knows what he is doing. And he knew exactly what he was going to do with Moses. And God said to Moses, Yes, he had to say to him. He actually spoke to Moses. This was the first occasion when Moses, he probably thought he knew God before then. But this was a real encounter with God. And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see God. To see God call them unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, isn't that something quite wonderful? So intimate, so lovely. The God called Moses by his name. That's precious. That intimate understanding and bringing of Moses into this first stage, as it were, into an understanding of who God is. And he said, here am I. He didn't question God. He didn't say, well, who are you? I don't know you. He accepted that this was something very, very special. Here am I. Oh, that wonderful, wonderful drawing of God. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein, whereon thou standest, is holy ground. Yes, the taking off of the shoes was a requirement in that, at that time, in the, for Moses, as, as a, a sign that he acknowledged that this was God. God making himself known unto him. Again, God, he was able to, because Moses had accepted, here, before me, this burning bush which is not consumed, this fire which is not consumed, the fire of God. And the fire of God comes because of the holiness of God. And the fire of God will come to you. The fire of the living God. Looking to fill you. Looking to, to consume everything, yes, which is not of God. And to bring you into line with God but on the basis that God is holy, on the basis that God, yes, maybe in the Old Testament, this is what we're seeing in the Old Testament, that it was God with Moses rather than God in Moses. And because it was God with Moses, God in the Old Testament will be seen as someone separate from ourselves. Someone who is so holy that we, that Moses lived with that great respect, that great fear of God. By fear, not something which frightened him, but that reverence for God. 
And following on this, there's a, another, another scripture to look at. Again, on this theme of holy. From Isaiah, chapter 6 and verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is another revelation. A revelation to Isaiah of the holiness of God, of God being the Holy One. And Moses, Moses, yes, he had seen this. And here we are many, many years later, many centuries later. And another commissioning. Yes, Moses was commissioned. And here we see Isaiah being commissioned and Isaiah seeing that he was a sinful man in need of cleansing, in need of purging, in need of being set apart and commissioned. So let's read some of these verses and look at. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So there we are. He was Isaiah in the temple. And he had this most remarkable revelation of the living God. The throne of God. The throne of the authority of the one who sits upon the throne. And this throne high and lifted up. God above all things. God looking down on all things. God in complete control. And uh, we have a description of these heavenly beings, these rather strange sounding creatures that stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Oh, what a, what a, a quite remarkable vision he had. Yes, these rather unusual creatures, these heavenly beings, but there, in the very throne room of God was the vision. And these creatures, and one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. A recognition, an acknowledgement that it is the Lord himself the Lord God Almighty himself, who is holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. So glory is related to the holiness of God. That there's no glory without the holiness of God. And it is in this acknowledgement that God is there seated upon his throne 
and holiness is the very essence of his nature. Holiness is that which marks God out, marks him out from, certainly in the Old Testament, from, the, from those who were his. And we're told that because of this holiness, the whole earth is full of his glory. Not that the whole earth is to be filled with his glory, but even now, amidst what is, appears to be so dark, so full of evil, God's glory is still at work. God's holiness is still there to be recognized and acknowledged because he says, I am the Lord, I change not. And the same with Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God the Son, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever, life without end, the very essence, the very, the very being of God, life without end. It, should Jesus Christ not be God, how could he then be the same yesterday, today and forever? He has to be God. Otherwise, he will be dead and of absolutely no use to anyone. But coming back to this, what was the acknowledgement? What was the impression made upon Isaiah because of God being holy? Verse 5. Oh, I should say verse 4, And the, the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. There was a supernatural manifestation of God. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He saw in the light of God's holiness that he was unclean. He was a sinful man and he was in need of cleansing. But God, he came, he met he met Isaiah's need at that time. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a life call in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And needed to be that cleansing, that purging. And it is still the same today. Not a life call being taken off an altar by a seraphim. But through the Holy One. The Holy One who is God the Son. The Lord Jesus Christ. He made the greatest sacrifice of all. Through his own blood. His own blood being the only way whereby sins can be forgiven. Nothing else can wash away your sin but the blood of Jesus. 
yes, that wonderful, wonderful chorus of whatever it was of days gone by. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have you had your sins washed away? by the blood of Jesus, having, like Isaiah, acknowledged that you are of unclean lips, that you are sinful, and it is God in all his holiness, because he is holy, and because he is holy, then he has to have those who have been cleansed of their sins because to be in his presence which is fullness of joy then there is nothing sinful no sins are permitted to be in his presence because of his holiness and that is why there still has to be the only gospel message that can bring about forgiveness of sins to still be preached. And that is that God is holy. And because he is holy, he demand, demanded that his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, took upon himself the sins of mankind. So to be crucified and through every drop of his blood to make a perfect atonement that you and any other sinner on repentance of sins and the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can receive a pardon and can be accepted by God God who is holy and as we develop this study over the next couple of days to see that in the New Testament that God would take matters a step further that it wouldn't just be God outside of us but it will be God in us in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God. O God, our Father, we thank Thee from the very depths of our hearts for Thy perfect plan, which we see in its holiness, seeing You reveal in Your holiness to Moses and to Isaiah, and that we will be able to see that your plan is a perfect plan, that nothing was overlooked, and that we will find in the Lord Jesus Christ all that you have brought about, whereby you yourself, the Holy One, would come and indwell those who have repented of their sins, and received the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus. For this is asked in his name and for your glory. Amen.